So you already sent the link to everyone. This is going to be on YouTube. So uh, we want to just say once again for Linda Fabio, God bless you. Happy birthday. We don't want you to think we forgot you. Amen. Amen. So tonight we're going to be talking about um, what self-bitterness leads to, what happens when we don't take care of self-bitterness. Uh, we're always putting ourselves down. But we're going to get into the area of jealousy and envy um, because that's a couple of topics that we, we want to share about tonight. Jealousy and envy. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, I want you to open up to Ecclesiastes 4.4. It says, again, I considered all travail and every right work, that for this a man is envied for his neighbor. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. Do you have the NLT in that? I'd like to see what that says. Then I observed that most people are motivated to success because they envy their neighbors. But this too is meaningless, like chasing the wind. What is envy? It's not jealousy. There's a difference between jealousy and envy. A lot of people don't realize that. It's kind of like the same, but it's a little bit different. And I'll explain that to you. Uh, envy is, is a means to bear a grudge towards someone due to coveting what that person has or enjoys. Even in a milder sense, it means the longing for something someone else has without any ill will intended toward that person. So you can end, it's envying what another person has. Um, jealousy is, is an apprehension or a vengeful out of fear of being replaced by someone else. It can also mean watchful or anxiously suspicious. So jealousy is a little bit different than envy. Envy is, is wanting something that somebody else has, and jealousy is, is um, not wanting to lose what you have. And I'll give you some examples of that as we go on. Okay. Um, in Galatians 6.4, it says, Let each one examine his own work, that he can take pride in himself and not compare himself with somebody else. And that's what happens a lot of times, even in ministry. If you, if you start to look at, um, in other words, you compare churches with someone else's church, and you begin to look at someone else's church, and you see it growing, you see it big and whatever. As a pastor, you can, you can, even as a pastor or a leader, or even as a congregation, you can be looking at that and envying what they have. Okay, and um, like I said, jealousy is worrying about losing something that you have. In other words, like if you have a relationship, <laughs> jealousy can kill a relationship uh, because um, of because of self pity or self bitterness or, or not accepting yourself and you're uh, you're against yourself. What happens a lot of times is is when when uh, somebody comes along and starts to look better than you or have better gifts than you or better talents than you uh, or is uh, um, more uh, equipped than you are, then you can feel like that person is trying to take your place. Uh, it can even be in relationships. Uh, if you're not careful, <clears throat> you can be jealous in a bad way with a relationship. In other words, uh, someone comes in uh, that you, is it because it's, it all has to do with self-awareness. It all has to do with how you look at yourself. If you feel you're ugly or you feel you're, you're, you're unqualified or you don't feel like you're anything special, then what happens is someone, com someone comes along and starts talking to your mate, and all of a sudden you, you feel jealous because that person, you, you feel like maybe that person is going to take my husband or my wife away from me. And you can't do that. You can't go through life like that. 
um, the, uh, the enemy will come and, and attack your mind and, and you begin to think things that are not true. Uh, Proverbs 14, 15 says, Only simpletons believe everything they're told. They're prudent, carefully consider their steps. <clears throat> Let's look at that again. Only simpletons believe everything they're told. Don't believe everything that's told to you by someone else. You know, we talked about that, how growing up, how um, this can have an ill effect on you in your relationships. <clears throat> if someone keeps downing you and telling you you're no good and that you're never going to amount to anything and that what's wrong with you, there's something wrong with you, <clears throat> what happens is after a while when you start hearing that over and over again, you believe that, and as you think it, so so are you. If you think that and you believe that, then what happens? That becomes who you are. If you believe it. Well, I'm no good. I'm not going to amount to anything. And so what happens is you begin to have a self-pity on yourself. <coughs> Excuse me. And you begin to not want to accomplish things because you feel that you're not worthy of it. And so a lot of times what people, they don't get out of their situation because they feel like they're not worthy to be out of that situation. And they, and they stay in that situation because it almost becomes a comfort zone to them. It's something they've grown accustomed to. It's something that they've grown used to, and they stay in that place. Let me uh, find my book. So don't believe everything you hear. Envy will hurt you. If you are a Christian and you're constantly on social media, there is a strong chance that you will start to envy others. <clears throat> I, I think it was my wife. Didn't you say that you stopped looking at fly, the flyers coming into the house? <clears throat> you ever notice that sometimes neighbors, they have competition with each other? They start to envy each other. Oh, this one got a new awning for their house. I'm going to get a new awning. This one got a new barbecue. I'm going to get a new barbecue. Okay, and it almost becomes a competition. And you begin to envy somebody else. Or you begin to envy them because you can't have that because you can't afford it. And what happens is when we have that kind of envy uh, of, of wanting something, okay, that somebody else has, it can fall in the area of covetousness, but not, it's, it's, it's a little bit different. When you really envy that thing, you know, you, you're envying something that somebody else has. You see somebody more talented than you. You see somebody that sings better than you. And then what happens is, is when you do that, when you start comparing yourself, what happens is the enemy steps into that and says, yeah, you're not as good as that person. In fact, you're really lousy. Why don't you sit down? Why don't you shut up? You know, nobody wants to listen to you sing. You know, and you know what I'm telling, telling you, okay? And, and you have to be careful with that uh, in all areas of your life because that can really control things in you, okay, and stop you from doing things that God wants you to do. Amen? We must be careful that we don't cause others to envy. I know you're probably saying it's not my fault if, if people envy. Sometimes it can be. Many people struggle with this and we can make it worse by our boasting. Be careful not to boast, which is sinful. Okay? If your friend got rejected to a college that just accepted you, then don't rejoice in front of them. Same with a job. If you went with another person to a job and you and you got the job and they didn't, don't rejoice in front of that person. You know? Because then it makes that other person feel bad. There's one thing that leads to envy. 
and that's insecurity. When you're insecure, that leads to envy, to jealousy, and shame. Envy, jealousy, and shame are intertwined. Energy and jealousy, uh, envy and jealousy are primal emotions that frequently they overlap. Children are frequently envious and jealous of the attention showed on a newborn sibling. Belief that a sibling is favored can create lifelong feelings of shame and inadequacy. So you have to be careful. Sometimes when parents show, uh, you know, they have this one baby, and that baby grows up, and I've heard testimonies, of, well, not testimonies, but I've heard stories of people, how that, you know, they were the only ones, you know, up until the time they were 12, 13. And then what happens is another baby comes on the scene, and all of the attention goes on that baby. And what happens now is that other person begins to feel insecure because they're not getting the same attention, they're not getting the same love. And it can not only happen with kids, it can happen with wives, it can happen with husbands. They have an insecurity because <clears throat> it's been affected in their life. Sometimes people, if they have a lot of children, they pay attention to one specific one. And I'm reminded of the story of Joseph. Okay? If you want a biblical account of what that's like. Joseph had, what, 11 other brothers, right? And um, yet the father favored him more, right? Gave him a coat of many colors, you know. <clears throat> you know how it is when you spoil one above, above another, right? Uh, how, come, how come that one got the new car, and when I, it was time for my car, you got me a used car? Okay, and what's some of the things that they say? You love them more than you love me. Okay, which is can be a, a plot of manipulation and intimidation. Okay, a lot of parents they give into that and they start to supply everything for their kids and they feel guilty, and that's because of insecurity in their own life. Okay, <clears throat> but Joseph, here he is, he's innocent. Okay, he's just accepting this love and he's enjoying this love, probably doing what he shouldn't have done. Like I just said about the college thing, uh, you know, the job thing, the person gets, gets accepted and starts rejoicing in front of the person that applied and didn't get accepted. <clears throat> so here's Joseph, he gets this dream and he's all excited, you know, and oh wow, this is great. But what happens? Envy, jealousy. And when it's not taken care of and it's not dealt with, what happens? It, that jealousy and envy that's internal becomes external. And it begins to take action. What do they do? They started to plot the death of their own brother. Think about that. Because of envy and jealousy, <clears throat> they want to kill their own brother. So they begin to plot that. And then finally, they get a hold of him. They start mistreating him. Why did they do that? It was because of the insecurities they had. They were not secure in the relationship they had with their father. And I tell you, that's where a lot of insecurities come from, is when you don't have a good relationship with your father. Because the father is the figurehead. And when you don't have that figurehead example in your life or when you have that figurehead that's always knocking you down always talking you know bad about you not really showing you the love and the care and a lot of times the father really doesn't know how to share that especially if they're not a Christian sometimes if they are a Christian they're never taught how so they just go by how they feel and what they think is right and then uh, what happens is, is that the the child grows up with tremendous insecurities. And they feel like they're not loved, and they feel they're not accepted. And so what happens is, is when they get older, they start turning to people and things. You ever wonder why some people have relationships that are destructive? 
if you see somebody that's gone through uh, uh, with a father or mother were uh, physically abusive or, or mentally abusive or emotionally abusive, and then that kid grows up in that environment, and if it's not taking care of those insecurities, they'll, they'll be attracted to those kinds of people. You ever see some, some women, they're attracted to men that treat them like dirt? And you go, how can you stay with that person? Because they feel insecure that they are not worthy of anybody better than that. If they look down upon themselves and say, I'm ugly, I'm this, I'm that, I'm not the most beautiful, I'm not the best dressed, I don't do this, I don't do that. And so therefore they, they do what I call settling. And they settle for the person that will come along and love them. It doesn't matter how they look, it doesn't matter what they do, they just settle for that person. And what ends up happening is they end up getting hurt. Because that person knows they can walk all over them. They start taking advantage of them. <clears throat> Envying is feeling a discontent or a covetousness with regard to someone's advantages, possessions, or traits such as beauty, success, or talent. It's also common defense to shame when we feel less than another in some respect. When the desire, when I'm sorry, when the defense is working, we're not aware of feeling inadequate. <clears throat> Excuse me. We may even feel superior at despise of the person we envy. And let me give you an example. Bill was uh, chronically resentful and envious of his brother's financial success. But because of unconscious shame, listen to this, because of unconscious shame, he spent or gave away his money. He was on the road to homelessness to fulfill his father's shaming curse that he was a failure and would end up on the street. So he was actually feeding into the very thing his father said. You're no good, you're going to end up on the street. So because of the shame of not being as good as his brother, he just would give away all of his money, just keep giving it. And, and it was a, a way of, of feeling accepted or feeling like, hey, I'm doing something good anyway. But at the, at the detriment of himself, he wasn't using wisdom. He wasn't using <clears throat> balance. He wasn't using the, the ability to see the shamefulness in the subconscious. So that's why we need counseling sometimes because we need to be able to see these things brought to the forefront. Now, jealousy stems from the feelings of inadequacy. And though they are usually more conscious than with envy, however, whereas envy is the desire to possess what someone else has, jealousy is the fear of losing what we have. Got that? Envy is the desire to possess what someone else has. Jealousy is the fear of losing what we have. We feel vulnerable to losing the attention or feelings of someone close to us. And it is defined as mental uneasiness due to suspicion of fear or rivalry or unfaithfulness and may include envy when our rival has aspects that we desire. How come that person got the job? How come that person got promoted? <clears throat> and we begin to do that. Jealousy, believe it or not, is the leading cause of spousal homicides. Margaret's deep-seated belief that she was inadequate and undeserving of love motivated her to seek male attention and at times intentionally act in ways to make her boyfriend jealous. <clears throat> that happens. And more eager. Her insecurity also made her jealous. When you have insecurities, okay, if you if you have person if you have if your, if your boyfriend or your girlfriend is talking to someone else and you begin to be jealous, it's because you feel that you're inferior to that person and that they, that person is going to take away something that you have. And that's from an insecurity. 
you see that happen sometimes with people that are dating. <clears throat> a person will flirt, will be with somebody, but will stop flirting, and then that person gets jealous because they feel inferior to that person. But here's the way you should look at it. If you are if you are in control of who you are, okay, and you have yourself in check that you know who you are, you don't you're not you're not you're not believing the lies of, of what people say, or you're not believing the lies of what the devil says about you. Remember what I told you, changing your information base? Changes your operation base, you get a different result. <clears throat> but if you keep doing the same thing over and over again, you'll never change. That's why people don't change. They don't change their information base. Well, you're no good. You're always going to be no good. You're not, this ain't going to work. That ain't going to work. I'll never be delivered. I'll never this. And you believe that information base. Well, then it's not going to change the operation base. You're not going to change anything. You're going to still continue to be the same way now, today, and forever because you're not making the identity of changing the things that is spoken of you, whether it's through people whether it's through the devil <clears throat> or your own self and your own insecurities. And unless you take authority over those things and begin to bring those feelings into play so that you believe what God says about you. And we talked all about that before. Now, so her insecurity also made her jealous. And I was talking about this example of how she makes her boyfriend jealous. She imagined that he desired other women more than her when it wasn't the case. Her beliefs reflect toxic or internalized shame common among codependents. It's caused by the emotional, listen to this, it's caused by the emotional abandonment in childhood and leads to problems in intimate relationships. Studies show that insecure individuals are more prone to jealousy. That's the truth. And you probably know somebody like that. Amen. Okay, but that comes from their childhood. And the insecurity that they have about themselves. Now, there was someone... Her name is Jill, and she had a healthy self-esteem. When her boyfriend has lunch with his female friend and work colleagues, she isn't jealous because she's secure in that relationship and her own lovability. If he had an affair, she would have feelings about his betrayal or trust, but not necessarily jealousy. That's the issue, because she doesn't hold the belief that his behavior reflects a deficiency in her. When you have a healthy relationship of, of yourself and you know where you stand, it doesn't affect you that way. But see, there's a, a lot of people, and I know some people personally that I've been trying to help, that have tremendous jealousy and insecurity because of how they've been treated in the past. Let me uh, go over some things here. Let me see. This is some of the things that happen when people begin to loathe themselves. They begin to look down on themselves. Okay. They don't feel adequate. Okay. They envy somebody else. Oh, if I, and especially women do this all the time. Wow, I wish I had a shape like that. Oh, wow, I wish I had that kind of hairdo. Oh, I wish I could wear those kind of clothes. And so what happens is, is that there's okay to do that to a certain extent, but when it becomes compulsory and you begin to think about that and it really begins to bring you down, that's when there's a problem. I'm just going to go over a few things that happen when, when you have this kind of self-loathing about yourself. One of the things that people do is, they under or overeat. Let 
Many people who struggle with self-loathing, they punish themselves with food either by not eating enough or by binging. <clears throat> how, how many here ever saw The Nutty Professor with Eddie Murphy? Right? Remember when he got really down because things were going right? He's sitting in front of the TV and he's eating a half gallon of ice cream and he's crying and he's just feeding his face. That's what happens. We look for comfort in the times when we're being hurt. Rather than, in, rather than dealing with the emotions and the feelings, we're actually, we're actually feeding those feelings by trying to compensate by something that makes us feel good. Those who deny themselves food okay, often feel like they don't deserve the nourishment. Or they'll deny themselves everything except foods they dislike as a sort of punishment for even existing. Those who overeat do so in order to feel shame later. It's a solid excuse for despising themselves. Number two, what happens is sometimes it's physical neglect. They neglect themselves physically. People may stop bathing regularly. <clears throat> stop brushing their hair or their teeth. Wear the same clothes to sleep and that they wore during the day, etc. They stop caring about their physical appearance. And neglect even the basics of personal hygiene. I've seen people like that, haven't you? They just don't take care of themselves. Not necessarily because they truly don't care, but because they may feel like they don't deserve to look or feel good. And that's sad. People can feel that way about themselves. Especially people that have been physically abused. When you've been physically abused, you can that can turn on you in, in where you think that you deserved it because... You're not worthy. You, you, you know, you're not good looking, or you're not this, or you're not that, and you're not that. And so I deserve that. No, you don't deserve that. Nobody deserves that. No one deserves physical abuse. No one. They punish themselves with neglect and then feel validated in hating themselves more and more. It becomes a vicious cycle. They just keep going on and on and on and on. Self-destructive. <clears throat> Number three is a big one. Defeatism. Why bother trying? I just go, I'm just going to suck at it anyway. Why, 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 why try? Because it always ends up in failure. <clears throat> and even as Christians, we can have that mentality. Well, I'm not going up for prayer anymore. I've been up for prayer so many times it didn't work. But no one ever asked the question, why is my attitude like that? Or you come up for prayer and you come up in the line, and while you're standing in the line, you say, I hope this works. Well, if you're hoping that it works, you ain't going to get it. The Bible says a double minded person will not receive anything from the Lord. If you're double minded, Come on. You're saying one thing, yet you're doing another thing. You're coming up for healing, saying, I hope this works. <laughs> Rather than saying, Lord, by your stripes I'm healed. You're not, you've got to change your information base again. I'm going to fail at this. This isn't going to work. Negative self-talk like that sets a person up for failure. Where does your words come from? <clears throat> hmm? From your thoughts, right? So you have to think it before you speak it. Well, in some cases, some people don't speak before they, you know, they think before they speak. But most of the times, right, you're thinking, you're processing a sentence, and you're saying, and you're speaking. <clears throat> but as a man thinketh, so is he. If you think you're never going to get out of that situation, 
Okay. You know what that will cause? A negativity in you not to try anything. Not to try to get out of your situation. You'll stay in that situation. You'll stay in that negativity. <clears throat> Woe is me. Nothing ever going to work out. I'm never going to be, you know, what, what, I, what God wants me to be because I, I'm a failure. I'm no good. You know, I'm bad at relationships. I'm bad at this. I'm bad at that. I'm, and you start to make all these excuses up and you have these negative thoughts. Believe me, you're setting yourself up for failure. Which again reinforces their sense of self-loathing and shame. It also prevents them from taking part in anything that might bring them joy or fulfillment since they convince themselves ahead of time that they're gonna, they really stink at it and they stink at anything they try. Why bother? I can never do anything right anyway. It always turns out wrong. Okay. One area that I stop negative thinking in is the long lines I stand in. Remember I was I used to say, man, I get all I always get the I always get the long lines. I don't say that anymore. And you know what? I don't get the long lines. I haven't gotten long lines in a while. And I did that unconsciously. I'm not saying, I'm just thinking of it now as I'm saying this to you, that I get in lines now and they're, not, they're shorter. I don't get the coupon wizard, you know, that's out there with 50,000 coupons. And... Okay. Believe me. If you're double-minded, and, and we all go through that. I mean, we all battle that. But because of insecurities in people, okay, they tend to be even worse, even more. And then you have the devil working on your insecurities, <clears throat> telling you, oh, you're never going to do this. Oh, you're never going to do that. You're never going to get healed. You're never going to get delivered. You tried so many times before and failed. What makes you think you're going to try this time and, and succeed? So those insecurities can start popping up again. We, we put our head down and we say to ourselves, we're talking to ourselves, but really, uh, th this ain't going to work. Why bother? Might as well stay home. Nobody wants to see me anyway. Nobody cares about me. What happens? You believe those lies. You ever been around a negative person? We've had a couple of negative people in our church. Everything's negative. Everything's bad. When people tell me, oh, man, it's raining again, I say, praise God. You know why it's raining? That's because the grass needs it. And, you know, in the summertime, you see everything all nice and green, and you enjoy all the leaves and the trees and, you know, all that. Well, that has to come because it's going to rain. So rain is good. Well, it brings me down. I'm down. Why are you letting the rain bring you down? It's water. <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? People are so emotionally attached to outward circumstances. Don't be so outwardly attached to circumstances. Be happy in whatever state you find yourself in, like the Bible says. To be content. Instead of saying, oh man, it's raining again today. Say, man, I'm looking forward to tomorrow because God's going to bring that sunshine out. When he does, it's, I'm going to be, you know, it's going to be great. Oh man, when's this winter going to end? We've had a great winter. Amen. 40 and 50 degree weather coming. Yay, thank you Jesus. <coughs> Excuse me. Only had to take my snowblower out one time. No, twice. Praise God. Hallelujah. Look at the positive things. No, and I'm not trying to get like, uh, you know, be positive, not negative. No, I'm not trying to be like that, but, I, but it is, there's some truth to that. Yeah, but balance. Balance. The next one is self-sacrifice. 
either in an attempt to punish themselves for various reasons or in feeble attempt to gain worth in other people's eyes, people who suffer with self-loathing will often sacrifice themselves in any number of different ways. Since they can't drum up any feelings of pride for themselves, they try to appear noble in action so others will take pity on them and value them for their martyrdom. In their suffering, they gain a measure of self-worth, even if the actions they take are destroying them and everyone around them. <clears throat> Number five, acquiescence. A person who despises themselves in their life circumstances may just lie back and take it instead of doing anything about it. You know people like that? They just sit back and take it. They have no motivation to change. They may complain bitterly about the hand they've been dealt, but if given a chance to actually improve their circumstances, they choose to be passive and just keep taking it instead. This kind of behavior is compatible to gripping a burning coal in your hand, crying how bad it hurts, but refusing to open your fingers and let it go. But as soon as that would happen, they would begin to be healing. But instead they cling. And that, that can be adapted to things and vices that are in your life, whether it's Cigarettes, alcohol, drugs, whatever. You put, a, you put the label on it. You hold on to that thing tightly. Then you complain about that thing that's burning your life, but you refuse to let it go. Because that thing has been something of comfort to you. And so you coddle it rather than repulse it. You, you keep it rather than letting it go. <coughs> Acquiescence. A-C-Q-U-I-E-S-C-E-N-C-E. -E -E. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Acquiescence. Yeah, something like that. Numbers, another one we can talk about is hostility, hostility towards perceived threats. They might decide to dislike a peer at work, someone at work that you work with, because they think the other person is valued more highly than they are and more likely to receive the promotion they want. Hmm. They may lash out at a romantic partner for talking to another person because they think the other one is better, more attractive, are more successful than they are, and that their partner will leave them for the other. <clears throat> Everything is a threat to the small piece of comfort that may they may have dug for themselves, and they'll freak out if anything threatens that, or even in theory. They're overprotective. They're they're accusing. Amen. Here's another one. Unnecessary spending. Hmm? Unnecessary spending. When one hates oneself for a number of different reasons, happiness and fulfillment are often gained via material possessions. <clears throat> We've seen that over and over again in people's lives. I see that. I saw that in one person that we've been dealing with in the last year. They buy things. You know, they feel good because they're getting something new. They, they're getting it in the mail. Something's coming for them, you know, and then they and then they get it. Remember Jeannie? When we cleaned her house, it was rooms full up to the ceiling of boxes of things not even open. QVC, the shopping network. Buying all of these things just to feel good, to feel like somebody cares, somebody loved. And getting that feeling and that emotion but never dealing with the problem. A person might have a collection that they add to whenever they have cash to play with, and they'll go on shopping sprees in the hope that maybe, just maybe, 
this new stuff will be that magical key to make them feel fulfilled instead of hollow and full of shame and self-hatred. <clears throat> Some people even choose to spend great gobs of money on other people to try to prove that they are worth being liked. This can alienate the very people they're trying to get close to as there aren't many who feel comfortable being barraged with stuff, especially if it's expensive. Now me, I wouldn't have any problem with that. So if you want to barrage me with things, feel free. <clears throat> okay, let's see, where am I? Another one is isolation. Like I'm, we're talking about damaged emotions and how to be healed from these emotions. Isolation. A lot of people who wallow in self-loathing tend to isolate themselves. That's why when you're going through something, when you're going through a real battle or something, <clears throat> the, the enemy loves people that isolate themselves because that's where he can really, really begin to speak to you. When you isolate yourself, Pull away. What's that saying? You pull yourself away. You begin to isolate yourself. The self-hatred there, self-despising there, that you're not people to, I don't want people to see me like this. Why? Because you're crying? Because something's wrong? Deal with the something that's wrong. Share it with people. I can't share that somebody. I'm going through this battle you know, with my, my spouse or whatever it may be. Uh, I'm going through these emotions and these feelings. Um, some of you are still young yet and you're going to one day go through what's called menopause. Okay? And if you've gone through that with somebody, okay, the menopause, you're going to find out real quick who loves you. Okay. <clears throat> you want to know who's going to stick around and who's going to flee. Okay. Because things happen. They get moody. They cry at a drop of a hat. Okay. They're, they're, they're warm. You're cold. Okay. You're flaming. And they're freezing. Because you wake up in the middle of the night knowing that you have no more covers on you. I am. It was like sleeping next to a furnace. I felt like Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. It was seven times hotter. But dealing with all those things, the isolation. Sometimes it's because people feel that they don't truly belong in any social group or everyone around them hates them anyway. And that's sad. And that's the furthest thing from the truth. So instead of feeling like a stranger, alienated and alone, even a group, they'll hide away alone instead. If they are invited out, they'll consider it to be pity and may convince themselves that nobody else understands them. And they'll just spend time alone, at home, wishing things were different, but not doing anything to make that a reality. They just isolate. Another thing that they do, I'm just going to go to a couple more and I'll finish. Drug and alcohol abuse. <clears throat> Intoxicants can work wonders to numb uncomfortable or unwanted emotions. And they have the added benefit of making the user feel absolutely horrible the next day. When people suffer from self-loathing, they tend to feel that they deserve the hangovers and the fallout from their drug and alcohol abuse. 
understand why um, some I, I talk to sometimes some people and they'll say I don't understand about this fentanyl thing how can people die and go right back out there and do it again how can they do that it's because they loathe themselves they hate themselves because of the insecurities and all of the things that have happened in their life they they just feel that that's what they're deserving of. And so they destroy the very fabric of their foundation of who they are. And I tell people all the time, I said, listen, don't you understand the, 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 the drive behind that? Addiction? Nobody wants to go out and purposely kill themselves. I mean, well, some people do, but, you know, they're being influenced. We know who that, who that is. But it's like, Say, how can they do that? That's how they do that. If you got so so down low in your life where you had to sell your body to eat, or you had to sell your body so you can supply the drug habit of a hundred, hundred and fifty, two hundred dollars a day. Because you, when you're doing drugs, you can't work. Hello. You don't have a car. Most of the time you don't have cars. You don't have money unless you're a drug dealer, then you have money. But it's a vicious cycle. <clears throat> they feed off their own shame and end up getting drunk or high all over again to escape the shameful, hurting feelings they just experienced because of what happened the other night. So it becomes a, a vicious cycle. But again, like I, like I said before, there's a people that just lay back, they don't do anything about it. Because they feel hopeless, they feel ashamed, they feel like, hey, this, I've tried this before, it didn't happen, so therefore I'm going to go back to it. And they just go back. Nobody really cares. I'm a nothing, I'm a nobody. You know, I've had relationships and they've run out on me. So people begin to feel that way. <clears throat> Understand that, I, and I'm, I believe this, if God starts to bring some of these people into our church, the drug addicts, the alcoholics, we've got to pray with them. We've got to help them. We've got to nurture them. <clears throat> now, after a while, if they're not going to change, guess what? Then you're not going to be comfortable with them. Because we preach against sin. Amen? The next one is... Um, let me, hold on a minute. It becomes a vicious cycle for the drug and alcoholic abuse that's difficult to break free from, especially if a person has been stuck in that rut for many years. <clears throat> There's a certain comfort to be found in self-cruelty. People are just giving up. Another one is relationship sabotage. Since a lot of self-loathing people feel they don't deserve love or beauty or kindness or anything other than a kick to the stomach when they're already down, many of them will sabotage their relationship in order to keep others from getting too close to them. They might neglect or be physically abusive toward their partners or cheat on them or just mistreat them in general. And then when the partner leaves, they feel justified in their behavior because what the heck, they left, didn't they? Some of the self-loathers, some of those that really loathe themselves will even go so far as to abandon their partners even if they really love them and want to be with them. The rationale being that they'd rather take charge and hurt on their own terms rather than risk being surprised and hurt when their loved ones eventually leave them. It's self-destructive. Some even consider that kind of abandonment to be a noble gesture, and they feel that since they will inevitably end up hurting those they love, it's somehow better for them to set their loved ones free. <clears throat> free from hurt. They might possibly inflict. This is a big one. 
refusal to get help. Sadly, one of the greatest hallmarks of self-loathing, if a person self-loathes himself, is the refusal to get any kind of help. They just don't want help. They don't need help. They don't have a problem. I've run into that on the opioid task force. We come here to offer you some, some uh, different programs that you can look into. Oh, no, I'm all set. I'm okay. <clears throat> Are you? You're okay. You just overdosed. You died. You're okay? No, I'm all set. A person who is mired in this kind of mindset has a tendency to brush off any suggestion of the, shaw, of the sort because they know that it won't help. Nothing's going to help. This is how I am. I've always been this way. My father was this way. His father was this way. My grandmother's that way. My mother's that way. So guess what? I'm that way. It's not going to change. That any attempt that they make will fail and that all the therapists and counselors will just put them on meds, which a lot of times they do, or pretend to listen to their problems, so there's no point in even going. It may also seem like they enjoy their misery on some level. They find a type of comfort, self-pity, self-hatred, and wouldn't know who they would be without all of the negativity. Some people stay that way because they want the attention. And I think you just went through something like that, right? You were all worried about your sister, crying and weeping. Oh, the, yeah. and what happened? She was playing you. You let somebody, see, that's a good example. You let someone manipulate you in your emotions. And you believe the lie. The re refusal to get help is one of the very reasons why those close to the self-loather end up frustrated and eventually defeated by their behavior. That's when the, when the wife finally says, you know what, I've had it. I can't deal with this anymore. They end up leaving because the person isn't doing anything to change. The husband can't change the wife, and, and so the wife, he leaves her, especially if she's an alcoholic. That affects the life. Self-loathing is terrible. So how do you tackle these feelings of self-loathing? When a person does, wa does want to get out of the mindset they are in, how do they go about it? Well, first, it's worth saying that it is possible to transform the way you think about yourself, and your life can be better for it. You have to show a willingness to work on yourself and change. any change of this magnitude will take time and effort. There's no magic cure for it. Okay. Unless God miraculously delivers you. Hello? <clears throat> it was, let me give you my personal experience. And I'll close with this because we're getting later and later. When I first got saved, back in 1978, when I came to Jesus, he delivered me of smoking, drinking, and a foul mouth. Now, there was other things he was working on, but those were the three major things that had, I had, had a stronghold on. And I got delivered just like that. Stopped drinking. I was drinking every day. I was smoking marijuana almost every day. I was smoking cigarettes, two, three packs a day. Okay? And God delivered me. Then I was with the Lord for about a year and a half, two years, and I backslid for about maybe a year, six months, whatever it was. Went right back into those things, and I went in ten times worse. It was a lot harder for me to get back. It was a lot harder for the deliverance to come. But it came because I was aligning myself up in my heart, not just my head. I was aligning my heart with God. 
Now, God can deliver you instantly. He has the power to do that. Amen. He can do that. However, if you do that with an attitude of, well, geez, I can go back again and God will deliver me again. God's going to make it harder for you to come back. Why? Because he hates you and he's, no, he's disciplining you. He's making it, he's allowing it to be harder for you so you can see the depth of the, of the degradation that it causes on your body, on your mind, on your spirit, so that you will loathe that thing. You won't want that thing anymore. You hate that thing. And he'll get you to the point where you hate that thing it's no longer a comfort for you. It no longer helps you. And God's idea is that you draw near to Him. Now, when those things don't begin to satisfy you anymore, that's when people go into deeper things. Harder liquor, harder drugs. To ease the pain. It's the same way with, with drugs. You start off smoking marijuana, you start off on the light things, or you might start off with cocaine. And then it goes from cocaine, it goes to crack, or then it may go to heroin. Always looking for that satisfying. Always looking to, to get that satisfaction. When God is telling you right now, now is the time. Now, I'm not only talking about alcohol and drugs. I'm talking about even emotional things that have captured you. Um, <clears throat> one of the things we've been talking about, too, is abandonment. When you feel like your mother and father abandoned you, and the loss, and what that causes, the psychological things that happen, and you can get you can get healing from those emotions, how your father and mother treated you, how they they left you, and then you were adopted or you went through foster care and all that other stuff, but how God can restore those that feeling of having someone who cares about you, and uh, that's why I'm blessed, and Linda's blessed. Because many years ago, we went to a conference in Canada, I think it was. And was it a guy or a girl? I forgot. It was a man that came up to Linda. He, and he was used in a prophetic way and said to her, you don't have any children of your own, and you never will. But God's going to give you spiritual children. And that has been so true. And even with myself, God has given me children, grandchildren, that I care about. And I care enough to tell you the truth and to be an example to show you well, how to live your life. And I'm not perfect. I haven't got it all figured out yet. But one thing I do, like Paul, is I'm pressing on to the mark. Amen? People want to press on and they want to move into the things of God and they want to be healed, then they'll be healed. If they don't, they want to rest on their insecurities. And they want to rest on that self-pity and all of that stuff, they're going to continue doing what they want to do. Change your information base, change your operation base, what do you get? Say it out loud. A different result. Amen? Let's close. Father, thank you. I pray that, God, this would help people. I pray, Lord, that you would help me to be able to deliver it better. I pray, Lord, that you would heal the hurts sometimes we feel how we can be set free from these things by renouncing the enemy and believing his lies, by taking authority and asking you to forgive us for believing those lies, for setting us free, for standing us on the right ground, the right way of thinking. God, we just need to repent. And help us, Lord, to believe your word, what you said about us and all those things that you have for us, good things that you want us to do, that you want us to be. Help us to rely on those things. Father, I pray, God, that you would be with everyone as we go our separate ways. And help them, Lord, and help me to be the person that you want us to be. For your glory, for your glory, in Jesus' name.